Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the TSMU Q&A series. I'm your host, Ashgon, collegiate shoutcaster, and today we're joined by the wonderful Francisco Rodriguez, gaming partnerships coordinator at Twitter. Folks, for this Q&A, we're going to be pulling questions from our Discord, discord.gg slash TSMU. Direct yourself to the Q&A questions chat, submit your questions, and we'll pull them through to have them answered by a wonderful guest today, Francisco. With that being said, how are you doing, man? I'm doing well. It is nice and warm today. Nice and warm in sunny California. Mm -hmm. How, what were you doing this morning? Let's get a little bit casual. Vibe oh, and chilling. Um, just rolling out of bed, uh, getting on my computer, and just starting up the day's work. Starting so, up the day's work, getting through yeah, the no, schedule. Nothing too, nothing too crazy, but yeah, just meetings, work to do, spreadsheets. We'll get into the nitty gritty of it, but yeah. I, absolutely. Now, right now, you're here with us. So since we now know your name, we know the title of your work. Can you give us a little bit of an exposition on what exactly you do at Twitter as a gaming partnerships coordinator? Yeah, so that's actually pretty difficult to explain, but I'll just try to elaborate it as best I can. We get a so, lot of time. I'm just going to elaborate generally like partnerships. Partnerships is usually just, you know, you're managing relationships, um, deliverables and campaigns. Um, and at Twitter, that mostly relates to working with our industry partners, esports orgs, um, and just as a whole, that's usually what we do. But in my case, I'm a coordinator, so that means I'm here mostly learning from my managers and from other people around the gaming scene, just on exactly how do we execute those deliverables, how do we you know, meet our um, requirements, timelines, decks. I love making decks, and I've gotten some pretty good assets from internally, so I really love making cool stuff. And yeah, then just dealing from verifications, handles, uh, hacks, and all that kind of stuff. So my role is very multifaceted. I never get bored of anything specifically, and I really thoroughly enjoy it. Okay, so awesome. That the question. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it sounds like you have many hats to wear, all of which are fulfilling. And actually, I want to stop at something you said, specifically two things. Um, mm -hmm. Deliverables. Uh, could you go ahead and define that for anyone who may not know what that means? Exactly. I didn't know what that meant until TSM actually came to UCSB and they gave a panel about partnerships. And I, that's when I first learned about deliverables. So deliverables are ex uh, basically executables or agreements made um, along the lines between whatever campaign that you're working on. So for example, let's say Coca-Cola and TSM work together and they want to make something cool happen on stream. So that deliverable would be that specific event or that specific asset that appears on a streamer whatever the case may be it's very flexible but essentially that's what a deliverable is mm. so a deliverable is basically some sort of whether it be a physical object or uh, a logo graphic design that kind of represents the union between the two uh partners working together yeah exactly so whatever the two clients or partners or uh whatever they agree upon and you just got to make sure that the whatever goal you're trying to make happen on stream or whatever's appearing um, as an asset is taken into account the exact, as exact same time that it's, uh, you know, meant to be. And yeah, there's just uh, deliverable is a very small word for many different things, but mm. ultimately get it done and make sure it gets done well. Understood. And then correct me if I'm wrong here, but DEX is, is essentially just like a buzzword for a presentation, yeah. usually like in PowerPoint or something like that. Oh, yeah. So I think deck is just another word for presentation or for sponsorship pitch. Um, these are usually important. Um, let's say that these decks are usually pitched out to companies or to organizations or whatever the case may be. And you're trying to persuade the partner or the brand that you're working with on how what you want to get out of that meeting or that call or whatever the case may be, how you guys can work together. And usually the monetary or the monetary value or ask that you're asking of. So decks are usually to define your agenda, what you want, and just to make it clear and cut for all the parties involved. Understood. Keeps all the information in one place, basically. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And to bring it to your college days, run it back a few years, you are actually... Uh, a founder of Gacho Gaming, if I'm not mistaken, and UCSB Esports. Did you ever actually use these tools in, and uh, in your experience and your time kind of heading your club and organization? Yeah, so I didn't find Gacho Gaming. Gacho Gaming was founded back in like 2014 at UCSB. 
as a general gaming club. Mm. Uh, I became an officer by my senior year. Um, but even then, like as just as a general gaming club, when gaming clubs have lands or events, um, you usually have sponsorship stacks to get like different brands and different orgs involved so that they can sponsor the event, get some cash going for some prizes, uh, for some giveaways and stuff like that. So even at a club level, partnerships building, deck building, and being able to pitch and sell yourself is super, super important. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, I, I have all my like friends at Santa Barbara at Gaucho Gaming and UCSB Esports that helped me under, understand what a deliverable was, how to build a deck, how they asked for it in the past, like past alumni. And yeah, so it's it's been a long process learning how to do all that stuff effectively. And oh. uh, yeah understood um there are some people who are starting in a uh, smaller esports club obviously there are the ucs who have established their esports presence for a while now but certain people at community colleges uh need to know how do you what advice would you give to kind of help create and build those uh initial relationships with sponsors or partners yeah i, I actually attended west la college so i did come up from a community college before going to uc santa barbara um, and I would say first, on under, understanding um, who is interested at the community college in terms of being part of the club and being proactive, because uh, some schools are kind of are commuter schools or people like to be on campus. So that's definitely important to identify who is going to be part of the club. And when it comes time to legitimizing your club, your school and asking for partnerships, it comes down to being able to sell yourself mm -hmm. and knowing the fundamentals of deck building and being able to put on a good pitch presentation in my fair opinion it doesn't matter what school you come from as long as you're able to sell yourself your club and what event you're hosting Ooh, i'm glad you mentioned selling yourself because ken actually asked a wonderful question they asked what are your top three tips that you would give anybody to try and sell themselves so that sell themselves or sell their club let's let's try to dive into both if you can yeah let's um, get Usually selling yourself as a person kind of, I kind of like to encapsulate it as like this elevator pitch or the 60 second pitch. Mm. You never know how much time you have with a person or someone that you're meeting or might be at an event. First of all, it's knowing how to be confident. I think confidence is super important um, because if you're not confident, how are you going to talk to someone? So being confident and already knowing what you kind of want to say, uh, preparing exactly that you know, 30 second to 60 second elevator pitch of who you are, where you're coming from, your experience. Um, like it, it's a great introduction on who you are as a person. Mm. And then researching the person that you are going to talk to. Um, hopefully if you're on the fly, you know, you kind of already know who this person is. Or if you're going to go into a call, you're reaching out on LinkedIn or something, that, whatever the case may be, researching and knowing that person is super important because you can not only... Um, you know, find out what they like, what they don't like, maybe do a little bit of social media stalking just to see what conversations you can pull. Just a little. Um, and that's usually my three best tips there. Mm, understood. Uh, in a very popular anime called Spy X Family, uh, I think one of the main characters goes, uh, I can become whatever my target wants me to be, something like that. Uh, sorry, I, I had to go weave on you for a second there. But, that's completely uh, fine. I'm very weavish. You can see the Studio Chibli in the background. Let's go. Um, moving on to a couple of other questions for you, uh, Francisco. Question number one, since we skipped ahead to number four for Ken, we're going to go back. What is your background? Uh, what is your background in and how did you translate that background into working at Twitter? And I know we touched on your uh, collegiate experiences, but give us a little bit more. Yeah, so I hope that everyone's listening. Your major does not equal your career goal unless it's, I think, computer science, computer engineering, and being a doctor. Mm -hmm. I got my major in global studies um, and a minor in anthro. And for the most part, my major and my career path really don't align at all. I think what I got most out of college was the courses, being able to work with other individuals, um, uh, critical thinking skills, and all that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. how did that actually translate is that my major was pretty like work intensive because it was international relations, working on group projects and being able to coordinate with people. And I think that's just a really good fundamental to being being able to translate that into prof into the professional uh, industry. You're gonna be mm -hmm. working with teams, you're gonna be working with people you don't know, uh, getting comfortable, being able to chit chat, and then also just being personable was the biggest takeaways from 
my specific academics um, that I kind of just translated into my professional career. Okay, understood. Well, I work with teams a lot too. I queue into like Valorant rank solo queue. Do you think like that kind of counts as building my team experience and skill? Um, as long as you're positive and not flaming in those chats, um, that'd probably be the, be the best case. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. It's well. I'll keep that in mind. 100%. <laughs> positive, <laughs> the positive mental. So question number two, as we move forward, what is a favorite or the most memorable memory you have working in esports? Yeah. So this one's a tough one. Cause I've only been mm. at Twitter for about six months. There's been some cool stuff. Mm. But I think my most favorable would actually still be while I was, I think at Stream Elements, but I was working on my side um, project with a couple of the other UC directors, which was the UCEI. Mm -hmm. um, we've had two, re well, the UCEI is the UC Esports um, Initiative, and we're just trying to bring esports together across the UC system. Mm -hmm. um, and we did that back in 2020 during the pandemic. We did that again 2021 back in January, and we're hopefully doing that this year in person. Uh, so we'll hope to see. But essentially, it made me super proud because I think all of our UC schools, esports club and program have come a long way. And for us to finally start, you know, networking, working together and having these really, really cool big tournaments and events is kind of showing how SoCal's esports scene, collegiate esports scene is just growing and getting stronger and hopefully kind of eventually matching the East Coast domination of collegiate mm -hmm. esports. And it's just been super exciting seeing the events, the teams that are just developing across the board and being a part of that process on the partnership side. Yeah. So yeah, shout out to the whole UCEI like directors that have helped work on this. I love the sound of that project too, because Texas and the East Coast have had it too good for too long in esports. We need to show up. So yeah, exactly. I I'm really, really excited to hear about those kinds of projects. You mentioned Streamlabs in passing. Do you think you could have, give us a brief breakdown on what you were doing at Streamlabs? So it's actually Stream Elements. I think I might or have excuse me. Okay, excuse me. That's my bad. It's okay. I honestly forgot who I applied for back when I was applying, and I just randomly got the email. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so Stream Elements, it was actually my first post-college job. Um, it was an exciting, amazing first, first job experience. I worked as a basically like a, I forgot what my title was, creator success manager, which oh. essentially I got to work with uh, influencers and streamers uh, that were on Twitch and other platforms, mm -hmm. um, learning how to execute campaigns with them, uh, teaching them on, on deliverables and activations on Twitch. I primarily mm -hmm. worked with like medium to smaller creators on Twitch and then eventually worked my way up while I was there, as well as I was also working in the creator diversity program, which was the initiative founded the year prior that aim to just bring more creative diversity and opportunities to streamers. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think it was, it was a lot. There, influencer management is intense. It's very impactful. And at the mm -hmm. same time, it was such a great learning experience because there were so many moving parts. There's so many streamers that I talked to on a daily basis, but the mo the reason I loved it uh, so much was the interactions with these streamers was, Everyone is so great and it was so great and amazing to work with. And yeah, I still talk to some, even though I don't work at Stream Elements anymore. The relationships that I built and the bonds that I formed, I kind of carry that over. Or I still talk to them from time to time. And it's been a really great, it was a really great experience. So it was very hard to let go. Absolutely. So it sounds like you had a lot of work on your plate. To get into the specifics, you were talking about campaigns and I want to pull a little bit more out of you there. When you talk about campaigns with stream elements was it more so on the social media end or the stream itself content mm -hmm. maybe youtube uh like uh, video creation what specifically would a would a campaign entail and what was the work involved and you were talking about moving parts what else could you think you could uh give us in that that case? yeah so thanks for catching that because not everyone might know what a campaign is and that's just just shows that i went from like a college student to now an industry professional and i actually need to translate that accordingly um a campaign kind of like like a presidential campaign it's kind of you're selling yourself you're promoting something mm -hmm. in this case at stream elements i worked on mobile brand campaigns so everyone's favorite raid shadow legends oh, uh, no. was one of the main ones that's I your on. fault that's your fault <laughs> hey they're, they're great to work with um so going from mobile gaming's uh um, 
such as Genshin and that kind of stuff, to even mm -hmm. working with newer brands. I know HelloFresh basically invaded Twitch, and that was for mm -hmm. good reason, because they had a marketing team that wanted to work with Stream Elements. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of our streamers that we worked with, you know, were very interested or wanted to get into the scene. And then we, at Stream Elements, I saw that a lot of these boomer companies or companies that aren't traditionally in gaming wanted mm -hmm. to start getting into the market. So that's their campaign strategy. Stream Elements was there to facilitate, such as myself, of helping the streamers actually learn how to do it or do mm -hmm. the campaigns and do any of the cool activations we did on screen. So, yeah, it was just taking these brands, taking and putting them on Twitch, easing the deliverables and activations with the streamers and being able to help them naturally integrate into their streams. So it was really, really cool and really, really fun and very rewarding. Another key term there, activation. Give me a quick breakdown. Activation is the same thing as kind of the same thing as deliverable. Basically, you're just making sure that it was activated, like you push a button, it's working, that whatever the campaign mm. uh, requirements are, like let's say a tweet uh, from HelloFresh needs to go out from said streamer, mm. you need to make sure that got activated or you know is went out live or didn't get delayed or something like that. Those are just one of the like nuances of uh, campaigning and just making sure these, again, these deliverables, sorry, um, are being met and from the agreements that are being, that was in the contract, whatever the case may be. Okay, understood. So just to summarize and kind of restate what you're saying, a lot of these, uh, the abstract terminology we're talking about with partnerships and whatnot ends up being defined specifically in the language of a contract. Yeah, so I actually didn't get to work on the contracts, thankfully. Um, there's a reason I'm not a lawyer. Um, but yes, I did get to be a part of at least the uh, the process of negotiating. Um, you know, maybe that there needs to be two tweets out, or maybe you need to stream like one hour or two hours. Like those are the things that you can kind of negotiate that go into a contract that you got to make sure ends up, you know, happening and being agreed upon. Okay, understood. Um... Flash forward to kind of what we what your current position entails. Galaxy wants to know what's the hardest part about your job right now. So there's a there's some I, I as I mentioned before, there's so many different hats I have to wear. I think the hardest part of right now with working at Twitter, and I think that it will help me professionally the most is the attention to detail. Again, like um in the past two years, I've gone from working on very small deals, um, small streamers, and the intensity was really low to now being a part of uh, deals that are much massive in size. And so attention to detail really, really matters, whether that's on the deck, um, what information you're putting out, and deadlines. And mm. so I just got to, I'm now learning that, you know, all that information and all those deadlines and attention to detail is super, super important. And I'm gonna be honest, like I still struggle with it, but I'm glad that I have the leadership and the support system at Twitter to make sure that I'm learning very vital um, understanding of what my role entails and just skills overall that can help me with my career. Okay, understood. Those skills that you were talking about that were so important, how would you, um, what advice would you give to someone just starting out in collegiate esports to acquire those skills? And in general, what advice would you give them because obviously your experience earlier on in collegiate gave you a little bit of a head start, but we also talked about your time at Stream Elements. So what basically would you give out to people to kind of develop themselves and come to the professional field ready? Yeah, so I'll take a step back. So I didn't have any gaming internships or any gaming work experience professionally or even at an org or whatever the case may be until mm. after college, after graduating. Mm. So I was kind of late to the game, but the experience that I learned the most, or that I had the best, um, how do I say it? Like where I learned pretty much all the information that I needed to get my jump start was mm. in collegiate, as you mentioned, was working with my gaming clubs. So Gacha Gaming, UCSB Esports, um, working on LANs, uh, making club, uh, working on club events, uh, hangout events, um, all that kind of stuff. Even though you don't think it's useful or might be vital, you can put it on a resume. You can talk about how many people you brought into the LAN or the social media uh, posts that you or copies that you brought on uh, to the platform or whatever the case may be. Collegiate experience should up, end up on your resume. And I got that advice from a friend um, that worked at, at TL and she told me that that experience is super vital and should never be overlooked. Like 100% put on your resume. 100% get involved in the clubs that you are in 
and yeah. start thinking about what you want to specialize in esports. For me, I realized partnerships and just maintaining good relationships with people was my strongest suit. Um, not necessarily social media or video editing or um, even TOing. I can't do that kind of stuff. It's very hard for me. So finding your niche is definitely very important in that aspect. Okay. And I guess there's an aspect of self discovery. Would you say that that would be the case? Yes. In collegiate and in college, figure out what you like to do and how you can be the best at doing that. Mm. I think, and I don't know what your opinion on this would be, but I feel like a lot of people kind of come into esports with an idea already of what they want without maybe understanding how expansive esports really is and how many different things you can do. Mm. And in some cases, how many different things you have to do. So what would you say that is in that self-discovery kind of journey, would you say it's really important to take your time and understanding also not just yourself, but the field? Or where would you kind of prioritize the uh, importance? Yeah, so I got some really good career advice early on. Mm -hmm. It's more alert about learning what you don't like to do, which was kind of hard to digest. It's not learning what you like to do, because by narrowing down what you don't, you'll eventually find what you do. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I did have two internships in IT, like as a software engineer. Mm -hmm. um, I hated it, uh, to be honest. Um, but that made me realize, like, I don't want to do that for the rest of my life, or I don't want to do this particular thing anymore. And by narrowing it down, you're able to kind of just self-actualize and be like, this isn't for me, and that is okay. And um, I also came that to the realization with my own major like I knew that I wasn't going to use global studies international relations or whatever the case may be as my profession um with esports you can do the same thing you can realize like hey maybe I didn't like TOing at this LAN or maybe I'm not the best at social media um but I'm good with people or I like making graphic designs and by enable by filtering and funneling what you actually like to do then you can start networking and then you can start figuring out what roles may there be in esports. And I guess the best time is now for esports because it's getting even more massive. There's a lot of money coming into the industry, a lot of opportunities versus like 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and at this point, it's about researching and doing your due diligence of networking to see what roles might fit for you in the future. Okay. I, I want to pause on networking for a little bit there because Obviously, we talked about how we must we need to know ourselves, we need to know our career path, find our niche, and then eventually we need to get to know others. Obviously, you know, we met through uh, through a mutual acquaintance and we got to have a little bit of a chat before this and a couple of times before as well. Got to meet at the Hundred Thieves uh, event and whatnot. Mm -hmm. When it comes to networking, right, some places are more difficult to network than others. What would you recommend? to take as a first step to begin networking with someone and just really break into the esports and gaming industry. And let's talk, let's break this down into two sections. One for those who are maybe involved, let's say in the collegiate scene, for example, here in SoCal, and then one for people who may be more remote and a little bit kind of ostracized from the physical plane. Okay, cool. Remind me to make sure that I do both the remote and SoCal. I got you. Um, yeah, so for SoCal, and to just start off, most people don't assume that I'm very, or most people assume I'm very extroverted. I am not. I'm extremely introverted, was still super shy in college. I feel like I'm a lot more confident now, but that did stop me from saying hi to people when I saw them in, in, in IRL or even messaging them on Twitter um, or even LinkedIn. It's again, what I mentioned earlier, it's about confidence and kind of just blindly messaging people um obviously do your research when you're messaging them or when you're seeing them in person and just realize that you may take 100 shots you may have send 100 dms but you never know who might actually reply and i was fortunate enough that the people that did reply have become my mentors and have become people i look up to and sometimes have conversations on the weekly or the monthly and have become a part of my networking ecosystem Mm -hmm. And it's about first getting your getting yourself out there, um, being able to take a chance and a gander that this person might reply to you, and also doing research because you don't know if you might have something in common or not. Um, mm -hmm. Someone that I had network with was um, was previously from my high school. Uh, someone else I had uh, shared a favorite game with, 
And so you never know what the chances of the opportunity might be if you never try or you never know if, I think I don't know what that saying is but like you miss the 100 shots you you miss the shots that you don't take or something like that Super yeah you, you miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take whatever yes exactly thank you um don't just put yourself out there uh that's my best advice for those in SoCal we're fortunate enough to have a pretty good esports scene networking a uh, networking opportunity so any events you see online on discord or in person please go to them uh, I've had amazing, amazing, amazing experiences to the ones that I have attended in person. As for the people who are remote, um, again, uh, for the pandemic or graduating into the pandemic and just being proactive during the pandemic, uh, Discord and online events was super popular. Networking, TSMU, I can glad to be on this side because I used to be the ones that were listening uh, just as everyone else's. Uh, literally just absorbing any advice I could get from TSMU from other collegiate resources and any other resources in general have helped tremendously. Trust me, I could not do a resume. I could not do a cover letter. I could not network if it wasn't for all the available resources online. Uh, so please follow your favorite esports orgs, your favorite personalities, see what networking opportunities are there. And for college students, try to be friendly with other schools and other friends. And you never know who might be out there that might help you connect one day. Absolutely. I want to double down and kind of give a short story really quickly in that mm -hmm. I actually only started esports during the pandemic. And it wasn't until TSM University opened up that I could really take my first step, first steps. And when I finally got here, uh, I DM'd and asked around to see if anyone was local. And that's where I found um, Carlos, which, you know, um, and that's kind of what got me started. And I, I'm, I like you, am an introvert, even though somehow I ended up shoutcasting. Don't know how that happened as an introvert, but I'm here. <laughs> And it really is about kind of walking around with confidence, being willing to go alone. The in-person events that are starting to happen. Look, if you don't have a buddy to go with, who is stopping you from taking yourself and just walking up, DMing people? I think we talked earlier in the kind of broadcast prepped about how I DMed professional casters for advice. And while some of them definitely, you know, had something else to do, I didn't get a response. Others did reach out. So 100% every, you know, if there's any proof, uh, it's not just me, but plenty of other collegiate students are living proof about how putting yourself out there will get you the network. So Francisco, thank you so exactly. much for those awesome words. Um, I've been grilling you for a while now on all of these <laughs> professional questions, though. I want to take a step back and kind of talk more casual, um, just questions about things uh, on your daily life. So real quick or not real quick, give us a give us a list of hobbies that you like to do, things that you fill your time with and you truly enjoy. Uh, I guess my guilty pleasure at this point is League, dude. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I comes, it comes in waves. Um, I love playing League of Legends. As you can see that there's a Teemo hat. Teemo hat and then another right there. Teemo over there. League of Legends. This game has a, I have a weird relationship with, but mm. ultimately I can say that even playing video games, it's not a waste of time because I'm making a career out of it and you mm. can make a career out of it too. So that's the game that I mostly play amongst other games such as Elden Ring and all this other stuff. But game aside, I love going to the beach. I, even though I'm very introverted, I do touch grass and I do touch sand. Sand, let's so go. I'm glad that summer's around the corner now and that I'll get to enjoy being outside, um, going to meet friends. I love eating out. I love going to Sautel. Uh, may not be the healthiest thing for me, but I love it. Um, and I do play the viola. Something that most people don't know about me is I play the viola. I've played it for 10 years. It's kind of collecting dust over there, but I hope to pick it up again relatively soon. Wait, so. Pog, I also have a viola. I, I, I'm, oh. not, I'm not nearly as experienced as you are. I played like two, two years, two, three years in middle school, but um, it was like, it was, it's the instrument that I want to say like, no one ends up picking up. Everyone wants to be yeah. a violinist or like a cellist and, you know, bassists even have a really awesome uh, reputation. That's awesome. Fellow viola player, let's go. Yeah. Well, one, no one knows what a viola is. For those that are watching, it's between a cello and a violin. And the reason I got a viola was because when I was in elementary school and everyone picked their instrument, I wanted to pick the cello, but I was too tiny. They didn't have any cellos that were like half size or quarter size or anything. So they're like, oh, well, the best we could do is a viola. But it's so, it's such a beautiful instrument. It is, I love the mid range that it has. I played it when I was sad, and I still play when I'm sad. And 
I don't know. There's something, I have a really good emotional attachment to it, and I love it, so I need to brush up the dust and pick it up again. That's awesome. I guess we could, you're going to be the first piece of the esports orchestra when it gets together eventually. Oh my god, no. I went to the Kingdom Hearts orchestra that they had back in 2019, and it was like a one-time show, uh, I think at the Disney concert hall or somewhere downtown. Mm -hmm. Blew my mind. Seeing OTSs of your favorite, like, video game is insane and i think that they also did the final fantasy one like last year two years ago but highly recommend like it's amazing like your favorite music coming to life in front of you is beyond like insane okay i'll have to schedule a trip speaking of going to events and whatnot and we mentioned you were a little bit of a of a weave you know uh yeah. do you like to go to uh conventions at all anime expo comic-con things of the nature yes yeah, so i've been to anime expo every year since 2016 so the pandemic sucked um for it for canceling it i think anime expo is happening this year mm -hmm. um so yeah i love anime expo i have actually never been to twitchcon so hopefully this year would be my first twitchcon uh been to the lcs a handful of times and i'm actually like a raver so i go to festivals and concerts all the time actually uh so yeah i'm just super excited to do something i like in real life again uh the pandemic showed me that even being an introvert has takes a toll on you Mm -hmm. So I'm really glad to go to the back to these IRL events um, and mostly excited to experience worlds in person with everybody. In, in, I think it's in San Francisco. So that'll probably be the most exciting event this year for me. I got to figure out how I got to get up north. I, I'm no longer a League of Legends person, but I am a big like esports events person. Like the energy there is crazy. The energy that was at the finals in Houston for LCS was amazing like beyond insane like it's not you can't replicate that um you can kind of replicate it at the lcs studio here mm -hmm. in santa monica but nothing beats out a big live gaming event with a bunch of gamers that just are screaming and yelling for every single kill or something but yeah no it's just an amazing experience i can't even it flusters me because i can't explain how it actually feels okay hells yeah so Thank you for giving us a little bit of a insight into yourself. Hopefully that'll enable anyone watching to create that bridge with Francisco. You guys maybe reach out to him, which are your DMs open if any curious students have asked questions to ask you? Yes, my DMs are always open. Um, yeah, it's been interesting to see what the DMs have been after you put out there that you work at Twitter. So don't be afraid, but don't ask for verification. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, last casual... Um, Last casual question before we move on. Francisco, Brave is asking if you've improved as a streamer playing Teemo top lane in Grandmaster ELO. God, I hate my norms. LM MMR so bad. I'm a casual League of Legends player. I average like gold plat per season. But whatever the case may be, when I was tryharding Teemo uh, during the pandemic, my MMR raised up to like Masters. And so it's not fun anymore. But I have... I can now say that playing Teemo is super rewarding when I'm able to just make the enemy team tilt because of the shenanigans that I'm pulling off. Um, I've streamed here and there. There's a reason that I like working with streamers and content creators is mm -hmm. because I can't stream very well or I don't do it very well. I'm a bad streamer, but it gives me perspective on like how OBS works, um, how to like set up assets. I definitely had to do it at stream elements with the tools that we had and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So. God, I love Teemo too much. <laughs> uh, which is really curious because it seems that everyone else doesn't, but I guess to each their own, eh? You got the hat, so it, it explains it all. It all comes together in a very um, tight-knit bow. Now, we're going to move back into the realm of the professional questions, um, and we're going to start with a hard-hitting one once again as we uh, begin to slow down and close out. Mm -hmm. How do you handle stress, and what is your work-life balance like currently? And then on top of that, is there any point in time where you feel like there's a very important um, balance or story that you'd like to describe? Okay. You might have to remind me each question, but I think the first one was how to handle stress. Mm. Um, I would say when I get stressed um, on like a very personal note, I kind of shut down. But as the years have gone by, I learned how to manage it better. Um, and for me, stress usually revolves about sleeping and eating. Mm -hmm. So I've learned to kind of tone that back 
And the most important thing uh, when it comes down to being work stressed about work or school is time management um, and knowing when you can get things done and being very diligent about scheduling, you know, throughout that week or whatever the case may be, uh, mm. the work that you have to do. When it comes to being in a professional setting and in school too, so some professors are pretty reasonable, letting them know about what's going on in your life or your timeline on how that might be impacting the work that you do and the amount of work that you do and the amount of effort you put into your work. Um, being transparent is super important. I'm happy to say that the work-life balance here at Twitter is um, great and that I have transparency between me and my managers and coworkers that where we all are human beings first and you know working for the company second and that we understand like things that may need to get done immediately things that have less priority and again it comes down to prioritization and time management to making sure that you're able kind of like to distribute that stress out over time rather than like stressing that there's a final next week or a final tomorrow and you didn't study for it so being able to lay that out having a plan reduces the amount of stress that you can possibly have. Okay, then I'm gonna kind of rephrase um, my second question, kind of reiterate a little bit. So basically yeah. what I'm hearing is that the uh, the largest part of handling stress and kind of keeping your work life, work life balance even is clear communication with your coworkers and the people around you within the work environment? Yes, I think that's at least my personal experience on it. Um, that's how I've been able to reduce my stress because I think for me, a lot of it is actually in my head mm -hmm. or, I'm my worst like crit critic or critique. I forgot the word is, um, but I'm my worst own enemy versus like someone else could tell me you're doing a great job or you're distributing it well. Mm -hmm. And for my so for some people that might be the case. It might be you putting the stress on yourself, not the actual work. So understanding what type of person you might be will be able to you identify which stress um, factors might be able to be alleviated better. Okay, understood. Um, I want to talk about your community college journey a little bit and kind of how it affected you. How specifically has your community college experience changed your view and path in getting a job within the industry? Or do you think it has at all? No, community college had a tremendous impact on my interpersonal life, professional mm -hmm. life and educational experience. So mm -hmm. out of high school, I got into pretty much all the universities I wanted to. But when it came down to financial aid and all that kind of stuff, I was sadly not able to afford uh, going to university directly. So thankfully, community college is a great option for that, as well as a lot of scholarships. And I think in LA County, it's the first year promise where you can also go to community college for, I think, for free for a whole year if mm -hmm. you qualify. Um, and alongside understanding that there's a lot of negative stigma with community college, um, that completely like got brushed away once I was there because I thought that, you know, or at least there's a lot of reputations about you can't find a job while you're at community college or it's really hard to maybe some companies don't think it's reputable enough what the case would be uh i think it's it's ridiculous community college is a great alternative mm -hmm. uh helped me save a lot of money i've cut down my my tuition for my loans whatever like three-fourths of the way just because i went to community college mm -hmm. um took the time to really understand what i wanted to do the g's that i wanted to take um, what was best for me as an you know academic student, and realizing that once you transfer, whatever school you may want to transfer, they want you more than you want them, um, mm. which helps you finally have a choice in what educational path you have, and that graduating from a community college doesn't mean that your education is any better or worse than someone else. It just means you had a different timeline and different opportunities. And for me, I honestly, after looking back, it's the best decision that I made for myself. It, it is definitely an amazing option as someone who's uh, currently in the process of transferring from a community college. Little tidbit, if any of you have younger siblings at home or if you're currently in high school deciding on your path, if you do qualify for a college promise and you keep your grades up, you can actually get it for two years, which should be your entire mm -hmm. basically trip until you transfer. Um, and if you qualify for a grant on top of it, you can actually get paid to keep your studies up if you're living at home, of course. That is true. And what I did find out, the at least my community college, I had more or scholarship opportunities and more scholarships that I could apply through directly through my community college than I did at Santa Barbara. So all the money that I saved, the scholarships that I had, and as a low-income first-gen student, 
being at UCSB, I did have a nice cushion and nice way where I could focus more on academics than to struggle with the financial and imposter syndrome of being at a university in itself. So shout out to community college. <laughs> yes, let's go. Community college for the win. We stay on top. Uh, we move forward to the next question. How do you stay organized? Do you have any organizational pro problems, uh, programs, processes, tools that you use or have? The one that's been the most important has been Google calendars for me. Um, laying out all your school, uh, you know, your every day you have classes, when you have work, uh, doctor's appointments, everything, put it on Google Calendar and get the app, get the notifications and make sure that your timeline. I used to think that I was very good with knowing what I was going to do every week, every day. And then you miss a meeting and you're just like, oh, dang. No. Um, Let's go I Google Calendar. <laughs> Let's go. Exactly. I do it on the weekly view. 100% recommend that as a college student, as a professional, um, coming from Stream Elements and also coming from or coming from Twitter. Uh, again, Google Calendar is your best friend. For some people, they like using Notion. I've used Notion a fair bit to just make sure that my notes and stuff are intact. Um, and then for work, specifically for both jobs, uh, bookmarking, having everything they laid out all that ready to go instead of just thinking that you know the URL or whatever the case may be, just have all the bookmarks, organize them according to the file type. And yeah, and then planning ahead, just like prioritizing stuff that might not be as important or things you could put off a little bit. That is kind of how I've organized myself. And yeah, I would say for the most part, a pretty organized individual because of just the stuff that I picked up along the way. Right, understood. And I want to end off of a um, final question for you, Francisco, because this is kind of the question that is going to be more prominent in the minds of students right now as we have kind of recovered from the pandemic. And it is that how different is it to get into the industry now um, compared to during the pandemic? That's a really good question. Uh, shout out to whoever asked that. That's a that's a mind boggler. Um, I would say COVID did make things a lot easier because everyone was online and you could, I think more people were more receptive to replying to their DMs or their LinkedIn connections and stuff like that. Um, but I will say that nothing can replicate meeting someone in person. Every time I met someone that I met during collegiate, during the pandemic, I could meet in person. I was just so happy. And I'm, right now I'm getting giggly because just thinking about all the people that I've met is that human interaction and interpersonal ability is just so important um for networking for remembering their face or the interactions you had and now with things hopefully opening up and more opportunities for lands and events any event that you don't necessarily want to go to or that you're kind of skeptical on i'd have i'd recommend going like even if you're not sure you never know who you might meet um practice up on your uh elevator pitch and yeah, I mean, gaming thrives off of, weirdly enough, gaming thrives off of in-person events as well. So it's time to meet your fellow gamers out there, network, and start being a part of the industry. The daily dose of grass is going to be important for gamers moving who are trying to get into the industry is what it sounds like. Please touch with, grass, yes. <laughs> with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for queuing into this week's session of the TSM University Q&A. If you want to keep your questions going, go ahead and join us at the discord.gg slash TSMU for the next guest coming up in the next week. Same time, same place. But thank you, Francisco, for coming on today, answering all of our questions in such depth and giving us that delicious information that we also wanted. Before we send off, is there any final words, anyone you want to shout out before we go? I'd like to shout out all my industry mentors that have helped me get this far. I was a TSM viewer and always would show up at all the networking events and that the industry had to offer. And I'm just very privileged and honored to be in this position that I am now. And I hope to see everybody in the gaming industry. Hell yeah. Wonderful sign off, folks. Thank you. And without further ado, we'll see you next week.